Yes, yes, and yes again, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome along. It is once again Friday night on the bus, and it is time to get that Friday feeling. I hope you're all feeling good. Hope you've got that Friday feeling ahead of another weekend of SPFL action. And as you can see tonight, Liam's got all the accessories out. He's got a headset on with a microphone as well. Wow, going up in the world here, Liam. Joining the club yeah. for the headphones. Nice one. 2024, mate. <laughs> yeah. You do like you're in a call right. centre. If you're down the call centre club for the headphones on. I workaholics, that'll be me. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing anyway, I, wise man? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good, mate. There's, they're uh, they're finishing, finally finishing gas town the roads, which I think they started oh. around about the late 1800s. That's them just getting around to updating that. So um, I've been listening to a jackhammer all day. So, oh, no. But, and again, I have to listen to Greg Taylor's interview, did I? <laughs> <laughs> how, how long have we into the show? Did Greg Taylor mentioned okay, already? It. Love it. Love it. It's, 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 it's what like would a Friday night be without a Greg Taylor? Bit of slander. You know, it has to happen. It has to. But, of course, folks, welcome along to the show. We've already got 41 people watching live. But, of course, before we get started tonight, obviously... Do all that good stuff. It helps us out massively. Hit that like button. Helps out old algorithm CSC. Um, obviously, hit the subscribe button. I think we're at what four thousand five hundred and seventy something now. So just uh, treading along very nicely towards the five thousand mark. Hopefully, by the end of the season, we can hit that. Um, obviously, share the link of the Boise Bus Farmway. That will also help. We'll subscribe our count. And of course, you can get involved in our comment section tonight, particularly tonight because. If you're a long time subscriber to the bus, you might have noticed that uh, there was no TNF last night, there was no Fuzzy Night Forum. Life got in the way for Russell, Mark, myself, David, everyone seemed to be busy. So, do you know what we're going to do tonight? Do you know what we're going to do? We're going to have a Friday Night Forum. Yes, we are indeed. Is there a TNF? We're going to have the FNF. So, as I normally put up when I'm doing TNF, if I'm hosting it, tonight, if you want to get a comment, a question up, put Hashtag FNF at the start of your question. And myself and Liam will address them. We'll be talking about the St. Johnson game, obviously. But yeah, we'll obviously devote some time to taking particular questions and points of view from you guys. So yeah, if you want to get involved in tonight's impromptu forum, and hashtag FNF tonight is the answer for you. And uh, what else can you do for the bus? Oh yeah, head over to piesports.com and use that code BUS1888 and get yourself 12.5% off your order. Before that's said and done, uh, yeah, Liam, let's, uh, let's do our usual shtick then on a Friday night. Uh, let's talk about Aye. the game, because yes, there is another another cup final ahead for Celtic here, because uh, every game's a cup final from now to the end of the season. St. Johnston are in town tomorrow. Craig Levine, St. Johnston. Oh, I'm sure that'll be a, a defensive masterclass, that one. Ten men behind the ball, perhaps. Uh, so yeah, Craig Levine, because the last time St. Johnston were uh, at Celtic Park, they did actually get a nil-nil draw, uh, which is quite grim. Way back at the start of the season, the first crack in this Brendan Rodgers era mock two, and uh, yeah, he um, it was when Stephen it was Stephen McLean was our manager at the time. He was in charge, uh, but yeah, it's now Craig Levine. Last time we played them, though, we did beat them up at McDermott. Uh, but yeah, we're going to need the three points by hook or by crook tomorrow, no matter how ugly it'll be. And I get a funny feeling it might be very ugly tomorrow. We just have to make sure we go over that line with the three points, Liam. Right. It sounds like we're going to be a bit diminished tomorrow as well. We've, uh, it, I'm hearing that Scales is injured as well. No. You are hearing so, correct, yes. I mean, I mean that gives us some options tomorrow that we've like, sort of been forced into, but I think gladly we've, we've, we've seen it coming that it needs to be required. So who do you think is going to go in for Scales then? Okay, this is an interesting one, but my dad told me this news today. My first thought was, oh, maybe Navroski will finally get an attempt, but I think he's injured as well. I think that was Aye. mentioned last week. So, is it going to be, is Lagerbielka going to get a game? Or is Stephen Welsh, is Stephen Welsh injured? Because he seems to always be injured. I feel like Stephen Welsh has always got some kind of injury. He comes back for a few games and ends up getting cropped somehow. So, Aye. I mean, could, could it be quite an ironic twist that if Celtic do go on, Let's say Celtic do go on and win this double, which seems quite improbable right now, Lee, but let's just say high credit it does happen. Imagine if we ended the season with Navrotsky and Lagerbielka as a centre-back pairing and they turned out to be brilliant together. Imagine what that, that would feel, because uh, after what's happened to them this season, could this be Lagerbielka's time? Could it be tomorrow? I mean, it's a very Celtic thing, isn't it? I mean, the amount of times that we cry out for changes to be made in the fans, and we're just fans, what do we know? 
right? And then they put these things together, and oh my God, it works. So it makes you ask. It's like when you see Brendan, like you know, sitting players, like you know, what were you sitting Hatate after the first couple of games in the season? You give David Turnbull a shot, see what you could get out of him. So I know I think a lot of people, and rightfully so, have been saying, okay, we can't do any worse. Let's get um, Rocky and Lagerbilt, give them a shot. I think tomorrow we might see Lagerbilt, but you never know. I mean, other interesting thing we could do is Alistair Johnson plays in the back line as well, plays in the middle too. We've no ever seen that. So does Tony Ralston come in at the squad and we move Johnson over one? I think Johnson's been playing good lately. I thought since he's came back the second time for his head knock, he's, I don't know, somebody must have told him he's, you know, Maldini or something, but he's played a lot, lot better. You know, and so, I don't know, maybe it's an opportunity for him to go in the middle of the park. Kobe Ash is away as well, isn't he? So, I think, I think Kobe Ash is still in the building, but um, I don't know where in the building he is, to be honest, but I don't think he left, but I think he's so, so far away. No chance. Oh, my God. I mean, <laughs> I don't, yeah, I, we, we've ran out. We had about 20 centre-backs at the beginning of the season. They were doing about two. You know, un- unbelievable. This, this season's just been, uh, I think it's been worse than COVID. You know, I really, I really think it has as well because we had so much expectations with the way the team was left to it. He only really needed to upgrade three players. And here we are. End of March, you know, middle of March, nearly St. Patrick's Day, mm. and we're struggling to still figure out who our best for living is. Absolutely mm. terrible, and I don't know. I, I think end of this season, Rogers should be gone. I've I've lost all faith in him. You know, just mm. where the guys like Mourinho and stuff like that can sort of manage themselves with a job and you know lose it, you know whatever. I think Brendan's lost it. I don't think he has it with his coaching staff. I don't think he has it with the players. And he doesn't have it with the board, hmm. and he's not he's not got it with the fans. I think he's just got to take himself and his Gucci belt and bugger off. I, I do think it speaks volumes a real damning indictment that many fans, when the weekend comes around for the the game, I mean, I say at the start of the show, the Friday feeling. I think a lot of fans are struggling to get that Friday feeling when um, Celtic are playing at the weekend right now because uh, yeah, it's quite a. Uh, you just don't know what Celtic's going to turn up a couple weeks ago. We smashed Dundee seven one out of nowhere. Nobody saw that coming, and then it was right back to the malaise that we've seen for most of the season. And it's just like it just feels every time we turn a corner, and we think, right, now we'll kick on from this disaster is not far away. Uh, Ian Matheson's coming in with a suggestion hashtag FF bring back Bobo. I wish I think Bobo would still be better than some of the options we've had this season, even at his age. And uh, Wolf Gordon is saying should all replace skills in defence again. Could it be any worse than what's going on right now? Although OC he's is another one that's quite distant from the first team right now. Um, but yeah, the um, but yeah, that seems to be one of the defenses. But obviously one of the headlines. I don't think we'll see this player tomorrow. But obviously Hitati is back in training. It looks like it'll probably be after the international break before we get a chance to see him again. Is it going to be a case of too little too late? Because um it's obviously a player that we've needed badly, although when he has played this season. Whether that's down to the tactics or the player himself, but it's just he's just not been the Hitati of last season. Feels a bit like CCV every time he comes in. Liam picks up another injury. He's out a little bit longer. Obviously, if he comes back in, he needs to hit the ground running. But is it fair to really be pinning so many hopes on him at this stage? This is the stage we're at now. It's like, oh God, Hitati, this is this is what we've been waiting on. Is that again, it feels like what I just said a moment ago. But every time we feel like we've reached a point, we've turned a corner. Something else goes wrong, but yeah, we're now at a point now where Hitati's coming back, and suddenly it's like, yes, this this is what we needed. But I don't know. I I've got a bad feeling it'll be too little, too late, even when he is up to you know back into the team. But I hope I'm wrong. I hope he does come in and just absolutely blitzes it in the middle of the park. But I've just got this feeling that I just I've just got a sinking feeling, shall we say? I I want to see the Hitati come back. The one that scored that screamer against Craig Gordon for about 40 yards when he just wound up and he beat him cleanly mm. as well. You know, he wasn't unsighted or anything. It was just a rocket. You know, same with the ones he scored against Rangers. But this is a team where everybody seems to regress. His nobody can hold any form past three or four games. And that's mm-hmm. a stretch. That's the ones that are doing well, that have done okay. I think that's what's wrong with this team right now. There doesn't seem to be an identity with the team where they can actually perform on a regular basis and coming yeah. out and I think that's due to the coaching and the managers and the 
you know, the, the, the staff at Lennox doing the right now. Because I, I, I think we're just rudderless right now. We're just drifting and bringing back Hitati and throwing him into that mix as well. I don't know if that's going to help his game any, you know. But yeah. they're big boys and they get paid big dollars to play football. So hmm. you suck it up, you get there, do the best you can. Yeah, because yeah. the uh, Brendan's saying it'll be after the national break before we even look at that. You're talking the the game after that is Livingston Almondvale, plastic pitch. Usually players that have got injury problems usually get left out of games of plastic pitches. So I mean, what are we talking then? Is Hattie just going to be thrown in against Rangers at Ibrox on the seventh of April? Because that would be the next game after that. It's like, is that just what we're going to have to do? Well, of course, we've got to come through these next two games unscathed and hope yeah. that maybe Rangers could drop some points as well. But I don't know if I'd hold my breath on that one. Uh, but yeah, I mean, to see what Brendan said, that, you know, Patati may be back in training, but there's very little chance he'll start tomorrow. But yeah, we'll just need to uh, just need to hope that he will hit the ground running um, and will be that catalyst that we need. But I say it's very damning that we've got to nearly the end of March and this is where we are now, like relying on Hitati to come back and save the season. But yeah, we'll just add it to the list of many things this season that's just like... How did we end up here? How did this happen to us? Uh, one question is coming in from Mickey Moyhan saying, Forrest or Kuhn? Now, last week, the Livingston game, obviously it wasn't the prettiest of performances. We did make quite hard work of it, but despite all the negativity around Nicholas Kuhn, and there has been a lot since he signed in, justifiably so. I mean, so far he hadn't lived up to that. He was actually very good, I thought, last week. I thought he got involved in the game for his assist for Dyson Maeda's first goal, that pinged pass over the top was right. magnificent, just right into Maeda's path, didn't have to break his stride, finished it brilliantly. And yeah, I would like to think that that will give him the confidence boost that he needs, because again, right now, due to injury problems, because Palmer is also injured, we've also just sold a badder. Uh, Mikey Johnston is a new person at another club right now. He's absolutely tearing up, so he's no use to us, because he's away at another club. And obviously, he's with James Forrest there, and I think people would have an absolute... Well, in fairness, Forrest did come on last week, and he did look okay, but Again, it's at this stage of the season where is that what it's come to? Are we pinning the hopes on maybe James Forrest being the catalyst on coming back? I would think Kuhn would be the answer. I think the performance he put in last week was great. Got to capitalise on that and just keep it going for me. I mean, Rogers was... Uh, I mean, that, that whole thing after a match interview with Rogers where he described Forrest as uh, the best winger at the club. Oh... Did you like when you see something like that happening? I mean, what do you think of there when you know when he comes out and he says James Forrest is their best winger? And is that by what? Is that by reputation? If, and if that's the case, why are you not playing him then? Why is he? Why is he not featured? I don't know. Rogers sometimes just talks so much shit. You know that he like I've, I've just turned off him there. I said, just you know, just, just another Greg Taylor, you know. So it's like, shut it off. I don't I've even listen to his press conferences now. It's just mm. got so much bollocks. Yeah. I start with Kuhn. I, th- I start with Kuhn, and then I'd look to bring Forrest on for the last twenty for chasing it, same as we did last time. I think he's mm. got the maturity and he understands the role of change, trying to come in and change a game. I mean, are we going to start seeing Rocco Vata? He's got to be on the bench tomorrow, right? I think so. You know, yeah. I so because Yang's still suspended as well. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So fucking I mean we're we're going through them all right, you know. And still nobody's coming out and making that position their own. So I think it's just the opportunity for Kuhn to play two good games in a row. But mm. I don't know. I'm I'm not holding my breath. Yeah, no, I'd I, say again, it goes back to that. You just want to hope that this is some sort of catalyst that they can kick on, but it just feels like something you get a couple of games and then, yeah, it, it's, it's, something goes wrong again. And also, yes, we are aware of the noise in the background. Uh, Liam's got, unfortunately, some roadblocks going on outside the house. A jackhammer going away outside the house. So, yeah. <laughs> It's a bit of a problem right now, but sadly, this is the this is the way we find it right now. So I can mute Liam's mic when I'm talking, but obviously when he's talking, I can't mute him because obviously then we can't hear him. So sadly, that is going to happen from time to time, unfortunately. Yeah, so it's just uh, how, how rude of them. How did, did they not know we're doing a podcast here? Come on. I know. Uh, I know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, see, the, the, the good thing last week, I say, is a good performance he put in. So tomorrow, obviously, we're going to be playing a team who's definitely going to be playing a low block against us. There's no doubt about it. That is what St. Johnston will do. Craig Levine in charge. So hopefully, Coon can be that guy 
that can obviously take on the defence and find some pockets of space to um, unlock them. Because, uh, yeah, we need to obviously start quick tomorrow and we need to show that we mean business because we are in a position where this weekend we can go back to the top, albeit it might only be for about 24 hours, Liam, but we can do it, obviously, and go back up there and put a bit of pressure on them. Obviously, they've had a bad result in Europe through the week. That's their European adventures over. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I know there's a lot of fans saying, I want them to stay in Europe as long as possible because it might rack up some injuries, might tire them out a wee bit. Me, personally, I just want to see them lose regardless. So, yeah, they're out. That's fine with me. Um, but I don't know if it'll, it'll work to our favour or not. We'll stay away and see on that one. Some strange results can happen. Like we saw Murrow beat them the other week. Nobody saw that right. coming. So, yeah, we just need to just keep plodding along, doing our thing, and just see what happens. If we... And again, I, I hate to repeat myself on this one, but I said we're still in that position, Liam. For the time being, we are still in a spot where if Celtic do win all the remaining games, improbable as it may sound, they would win the title. Until that is off the table, it's still theoretically in our hands. But yeah, whether we actually do it or not, seeing and doing it are two separate things. But for the time being, we are still in a position where... It's still technically for us to lose, but yeah, we've got to do a hell of a lot of work to make it happen. Um, let's see if I can get some other points regarding the team tomorrow coming in from anyone. And uh, well, Graham Tyrell has said, with the scales, um, with injury to scales, does this prove Rogers was right in keeping Wagga Bielka? But again, going back to that situation, when you actually look how badly managed he's been, because he was kept because CCV was um, obviously the, the injury concern. Obviously, CCB is back now. And let's just hope he can just stay fit to the end of the season, please, for the love of God. Because that would just be typical of how things have went for us this season if he now gets injured as well. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's just showing again how badly mismanaged the lag of vehicle situation has been. But it's like, no, you cannot leave the club. We need to keep you here. He hasn't even featured in a match day squad apart from, I think, one. He was on the bench against St. Mirren, I believe it was. Yeah. And um, yeah, they um, he got on briefly in that game, but yeah, that that was it really. Other than that, yeah, we haven't uh, we haven't seen anything like Bielka. So if he's getting thrown in tomorrow as well, my biggest concern there, Liam, is lack of game time, lack of fitness. So it's like, is it? But again, that's the situation we might find ourselves in if he does have to turn to him. And what's what's that player's attitude going to be like though, Lager Bielka? If it's Brendan pulls him aside and it's like, look. <laughs> I know, I know I've kind of mishandled the situation, or mishandled you, but uh, I kind of need you to put a performance in here. I mean, personally, I think Lager Biel could be professional. I don't think it would do his CV any good to be unprofessional about it, but there may be something out of his control tomorrow if he does play, where I say match fitness, where like if he does look way off the pace and ends up costing us a goal, for example, then, yeah, again, it would just be more questions as to why on earth have he been managed in this way over the last few months. But yeah, does it just as well, Graham Tyrrell's asking there, does it not just prove he was right in keeping Laga Bielka? Because I don't think we saw this coming. I think we see it was just to cover CCV, but now we're in a position where Liam Scales is now the one that he might be covering. Well, you know, it's really ironic that the last touch of ball uh, he had competitively was scoring in the Champions League. You know, mm. I think Rogers is so that's the one where you can really see that we've not got the same Rogers back. We thought when he came in that we were going to see players improve. We thought they were going to get better. And he mm -hmm. would put that arm around his shoulder and be that, you know, that, that influence that he's been in some other players that turned their games around. Not seeing that. And the way he's handled Lager Bill, I think, is really, really bad. Coming out in the press, all the mm -hmm. sort of stuff that he said, oh, no great at training. And then he's great in training, scoring in the Champions League. I mean, any time he comes on, he's, he's, I think he's done okay. He's done really good. So I think just... Hopefully he comes on tomorrow. He doesn't make any mistakes earlier of that with players or, you know, mm. somebody gets on to him. None of that sort of stuff. So um, I'm hoping if we go with him that, yeah, he, maybe he comes out and he makes that position as well. You know, somebody's saying Boston Lowell. I've been watching some of the highlights for, is it Fleetwood Town he's with? Fleetwood he's looking a player. good, good player. Looking a really good player. But again, we tried to make him into something he wasn't. We tried to make him into a a centre-back when he's a midfielder and he's dynamic and that's what we're missing right there. We need somebody that can take that ball and take big strides. You know, since Scales trying to do it last time but he's just too slow on the ball, too many touches. He wasn't he moving through at pace the way like um, uh, Sarfelt did, you know? Um, yeah. 
don't know. No. I, I'd, I'd like to see Lager Bjork, but I think we played this one wrong as well, too. Where mm. he's coming in and we're, we're starting somebody that's flat, you know? It's like yeah. starting a yeah. flat battery in a car. So, oh, definitely. Tattoo face coming in, but I'm interested in saying hashtag TNF. I will get a tattoo of the Boise Bus logo on my arse if we win the league. Fair play to you, man, if that's what you want to do. Yeah, fair play, man. Um, but yeah, that would be, as I say, it's, it's still there theoretically. I mean, the double is still theoretically on the table. But seeing and doing are two separate things in the world of Celtic this season, it seems, you know, in theory, it all sounds good. On paper, it looks good. Where do we actually do it is another story because, uh, yeah, it's been just one hell of a, a roller coaster this season. And yeah, got nine cup finals basically ahead of us now. You know, next week we'll probably see eight cup finals to go. Um, so yeah, it's just uh, it's just going by game by game. We can't be looking too far ahead. I know fans will think ahead to Ibrooks and whatnot and cup semi finals against Aberdeen, but you know, we just need to go a game at a time here because we've got no right to be thinking too far ahead with all the team don't because of the way they played this season. Uh, another comment that came in as well, David Kelly started off with saying, FNF, do you think Rogers will admit that Ida is mince and start keep Ogo tomorrow? So yes, St. Johnston, they're going to be a bit like Livingston in a way, a lot of hammer throwers, I'd imagine, but a physical side. Ida obviously started last week against Livingston and they, they have the most hammer throwers in the league. They have got a very specific type of player. I've noticed that David Martindale, like I say, a lot of big physical units. And Ida last week wasn't great, yeah, let's be honest. He wasn't really involved in the game, to be honest. Uh, Kyogo obviously did come on and score a goal, albeit VAR did its best to make sure that uh, it might not stand. In fact, I think every goal last week at check when I was in the stadium, I'm certain every goal, including Livy's, had a VAR review. I mean, I know every goal does get looked at, but it felt like after every goal there was a stoppage to, no, wait, we need to check VAR, everybody. Um, so yeah, it was uh, one of those ones, but yes, either last week, I don't know, he was not really in it at all. But then again, Kyogo's had up and down spells this season, but overall, Kyogo's still the best striker at the club. But again, just a microchasm of the season, he's just been, you know, when he's capable of it, but the Rangers game at the new year, when he's on it and he's uh, capable of that goal that he scored, you know, he can do that. Uh, but yeah, just this season's just been a Oh, just a frustration, uh, one frustration after another for the guy, but by far the way, he is still the best striker option either, he might get a start to what I say, it's going to be Brendan will just look at the, the opposition essentially, say St. Johnston, they're going to have a lot of physicality, they're going to play a low block no doubt about it uh, what about yourself, Liam? what do you think, Kyogo or Ida will get the nod tomorrow Kyogo for me, I want to see my best player starting every week um, yeah yeah Ida doesn't have the football for me. I mean, I know he's big and he's physical and that, but we've not been getting the balls across high anyway. All the balls that came across last week were the ones that Kyogo would have picked up on. You know, as you've seen, like, you know, they um low across the ground. That's the one where he's better at. Mm. I'm just hoping that we've figured a way how to feed him better. Right? I mean, come on, how do we know? We've got a great player. He's a, you know, he's a, he's a Rolls Royce and Ida to me is looks like he's a really good rental car. You know, get you where you need to go and all that. And he's he done well, but he's not the future. Mm. He's near by on. Play your best players. And I think Kyogo's one of our best players. And then, if it's, and then if it's not working, then change it up. But change up the tactics so that we're getting the ball to him. You know, figure out who's going to be able to get that, swinging that ball across. If that's going to be yeah. Johnson, that's fine. But, you know, maybe it's Ralston. You know, I, th I think we need to figure out if you're going to play those tactics, Make it so that it works. I have a strategy of getting the ball to whoever's going to be playing up front. And for me, I hope that's Kyogo. Yeah, well, in regards to finding you know ways to play to either strengths, there was a couple of games there where I felt, oh, we are doing that. We're actually changing tact a wee bit here. The Dundee game, we obviously scored a header from across against Motherwell. It was the same. And it's like, yeah, we've not been doing that enough. But yeah, last week against Livingston, no, we never really looked to play to his strengths, but I say Maida was he was on fire last week, although right. in typical Maida form, he could have obviously scored a hat trick and he probably could have scored more as well if he wasn't like letting the ball roll through his legs in front of an empty net and stuff like that. You know, the duality of man when it comes to Dyson Maeda, you know, he could have got even more last week. But yeah, um say in terms of Ida, say if he's going to play, we need to try and play his strengths and get the you know get those high balls into the box. Cause yeah, six foot three, got to try and um 
got to try and get it on his head, essentially. But we'll see what he does tomorrow on that one, um, regards to that. And I say, in terms of other positions at the moment, the midfield, you know, there's talk that McGregor isn't, he's still obviously injured, but it isn't going to be, there was, there's worries about, he could be out for the whole season or the rest of the season. Uh, but I believe the talk is now that McGregor won't need whatever operation it was or the scan came back not as bad as they, they feared it was going to be. Because obviously, I mean, he's, he's I know like Mark, for instance, on the show, and he has been right to point out that McGregor's not been the McGregor of old, but I think some games recently have shown that regardless of how he's dipped in form quite a bit, he's not, um, he's, he's definitely they'll be in the worst this season when you actually compare it now, when you actually see it. I mean, last week, against Levy, Matt O'Reilly, who first half of the season, unbelievable. Like Matt O'Reilly, the idea of dropping Matt O'Reilly in that midfield was unthinkable the way he was playing. Since January, obviously, you know, you can try and put two and two together, maybe you'll get five, who knows? But obviously there was obviously a very public bid from Athletic Madrid for him. And Celtic obviously said no, you're not going, or they made it public that we're not we're not selling him, we're not letting him go at this point. And ever since then He's obviously not played very well. Last week, though, he lost that ball for the second goal, just nonchalantly jogging back. And obviously, Livingston actually ended up scoring quite a decent goal off of it, to be fair. Um, but yeah, it was quite worrying because, you know, you think, OK, with McGregor's injury, it's inconvenient. But hey, O'Reilly, man, he's playing well. You know, he's carrying us in the middle of the park. But um, yeah, the even now, you can't even trust O'Reilly. A water, most people were calling out for a water to be the secret weapon, the guy who's going to come into the middle of the park. And, um, you know, he's going to be the guy that's going to make up for McGregor's absence, but a uh, bit up and down as well. Bernardo, we've talked about this before with Bernardo, where he showed a wee purple patch at the turn of the year, but now it's kind of back to what do we really do there? And I still think it's maybe too soon for young Daniel Kelly to be getting starts. I think there's a bit of promise in Daniel Kelly, but right now, especially with this fierce title race that we're in. I don't think it's a time to be taking risks like that. But hey, I could be wrong. Maybe the boy will flourish. Maybe he'll come in. If he did get a chance, maybe. Yeah, you've got to start somewhere. But I feel like at this point, with the pressure being as high as it is, Liam, I don't think that's the answer. But yeah, midfield's becoming a real conundrum right now, isn't it? Aye. I mean, I heard Kelly's just got a four-year deal. I've seen that reported somewhere that mm. he was getting another four years. So you never know with, with Rogers. Rogers is running out of options. And that might be one of the things that they might try and either revitalise the side by putting in a young boy and, and hope, you know, what happened with, you know, Kieran Tierney or something like that, that we've got a star in the making there. Me, I don't see it. He looks okay. He looks competent, but he doesn't look, doesn't look better than any other boys I see playing against us that age, you know, in that position. You know, he, he, he doesn't stand out for me in, the, in, the, in a lot of ways. And that might be a good thing. You know, in, in, in that position that he's just tidy and all that, and mm. he, he doesn't stand up because you don't see him losing the ball or you don't see him shirking out of tackles and that. I think um, O'Reilly. O- O'Reilly's a strange one. I mean, there he's, he's not in the Denmark team uh, for the, these upcoming friendlies. says mm. he's still in the plans, but you're only in the plans as long as you're showing up. And I really thought, like, international football would be the catalyst to drive him on this year. It wouldn't be impressing Rodgers. It wouldn't be trying to get a bigger contract with Celtic. It would be getting recognised in the Champions League and then, you know, he seems to be very proud to be Danish and, you know, that mm-hmm. like option for them instead of like England or Ireland or whatever he could have played for. Mm-hmm. But uh, I expected him to come on this year and he doesn't, I thought he'd be a leader as well. And I know he's only young, but he seems to be one of the guys that we went through so many players and so many you know, them are projects right now. You figured he'd be one of the guys sort of appointed to stand out this season and lead mm-hmm. the team, you know, on the park as well when it's when the head started going down. And I haven't seen any of that from him. In fact, it's the opposite, as you said. There's mm-hmm. times where he's been really negligent and just giving the ball away, not tracking back, just turning off. I think this yeah. team's got a real mental problem. We don't have mental fortitude that what we've seen under other managers. You know, this whole we never stop, that is just a myth now. That is a, it's a faded T-shirt in the back of the drawer, you know, with Ange Ball and that, because we do stop. We stop all the time now. You know, it's like we we turn off, we stop, we, and we're going backwards. So, you know, 
we, we, we need to see some. We need to see the players standing up. So again, tomorrow would be a good, uh, good opportunity for Matt O'Reilly to stand up because you know Brendan's mm-hmm. not going to drop him because we don't have many other options. And I, wow, I hope he can build back some of the, you know, the trust and you know everybody was putting him based on some of the performance he had, where he looked, mm-hmm. he looked really strong and comfortable in midfield. He needs to dominate a game at this point because he's he's no dominating and at, and at that level where he's played, he should be able to dominate that midfield. He should be like, you know, winning out the boys, you know, and, and controlling the game. But doesn't it look like that? We're just chasing the ball about in the middle. We're not holding on to it and we're not starting many movements, many attacks for the middle of the park. It's still coming down the wings. And and even that has been poor, you know. No, definitely. And the, I, I like that you brought up the international point because I didn't know that he's not been included in the Denmark squad. And I wonder if it's a case of had he made that move to the Spanish league, getting to play for a top team in a top, top division, he'd be a shoe in for the Denmark squad. But now he'll probably be on the periphery again, but it'll be like, right, I think it's a 26 man squad they need to take to these tournaments. So it'll be a bit like, I think. Jota was considered for what was it, the World Cup in 2022 while he was still a Celtic player. It was one of those he yeah. made like the last 35 they narrowed it down to and it was like if an injury came up he might have went with the 26-man squad. I really might find that because obviously he's started to get some caps for Denmark and as much as we Celtic fans and this is universal it feels like across the world when it comes to club football fans we always put club before country it's very rare you'll find a fan that's all about country over club but for the players the the idea of representing the country and playing at these big tournaments that's huge to them some of us fans may be like I can't be international football I don't really care World Cup Euros and all that it's all about my club you know but for guys like Matt O'Reilly it's like he sees this as a big opportunity and now he's probably fighting if, if he misses out on the Denmark squad on the basis that the standard he's playing at is what's kept him back. And then it's like, if I'd made that move, I was able to make that move in January. That could have been what got me to the, the Euros. Because remember, uh, what, three years ago now, it would be 2021 when they played the last year. Denmark got to the semi finals. They were one of those dark horse yeah. teams that they seem to be on the right trajectory. They seem to be going the right direction. Here. So it's like they, they could be a team that could cause some upsets. So you know, they're, they're a good team to represent, so he's probably seen it as a big opportunity. And if he's not made these friendly squads, and the thing is, this is the last friendlies, I believe, before the Euros, because I know they're talking about this is Steve Clark's last preparation for the Scotland squad. So there is going to be like another one in like May, a week, couple of friendlies before the tournament. So Matt really might be like, oh man, if he's missed out on this, the chances of him getting to that Euro squad now is going to be pretty tough unless some injuries come up. But I bet you if he had made a move to Athletic Madrid, he'd be one of the first names in the the squad, because he's now playing at a much higher level for a much higher... No, for Atletico Madrid. I mean, they're still in the the Champions League. They beat him at Milan the other night, so they're in the quarterfinals of the Champions League. So, I mean, so he's, um, maybe that is part of it. I mean, I, I said at the time, I brought up that suggestion saying, do you think maybe he's threw the toys out the trams, he didn't get the move? But I'd also thought, I really does he strike me as the type of player that would do that and be that way? And I'd like to think that isn't what's going on. It's just a case of he's just a victim of the rest of the team are just playing terrible around him and he isn't capable of carrying the rest of them. But um, yeah, I I don't think he comes across as being the unprofessional type. But um, if it is that, if if this is what's bothering him, if this is why he's dropped in for him, um, to say I'd be disappointed is uh, putting it mildly. I well, you know, he said something in an interview really early on and it was like oh that's all my pal's gone now you know when Jota yeah. left and that and, you know and you know, you got to play with your pals and stuff but also there the, the seemed to be a group of players at that point were trying that were trying to excel and she talked about it in his performance of how he um, scouted and recruited players as well that he went after the character and all that and I think the way he handled O'Reilly you know where sharing games with Moy and, and that and bringing him into the team there was none of that complacency going in that, oh, I start every game, I play 90 minutes every game, no matter how I play. We've got a culture problem in this team. Neil Lennon said it during COVID season, and I think you can see it this. This is a culture, a cultural problem we have. we got far too many players that are comfortable playing with Celtic. Mm. And I don't think you should be comfortable playing with Celtic. It's a high-performance, pressure cooker, air yeah, gig that you're in at that point, and you know what you're getting into. You know what the expectations of the fans are. 
you, and it's and if you don't, it's very easy to pick up. You can hear them, like you know, guys like yourself go every week. Well, this is a team that's just, you know, the 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 jersey shrank to in, in, inferior full players. That's why I, I slag Greg Taylor because I just look at a guy that's so comfortable that no matter what he does, he's going to be the left back because we've got no imagination of anybody else playing in that position, no matter how much it weakens us in that side, no matter how much we're targeted. And you can see it going into Alistair Johnson's game. He became very complacent. So you're seeing that with O'Reilly. I mean, they're young boys and they feed off each other, but you got to be, it's got to be some frustrated people at, tra- at training mm. where you get guys like Lagerbilt that's not getting anywhere near a sniffy game. You know, and then you've got guys that are playing 90 minutes every week that just shouldn't it be because they're not as good as players, as players sitting on the bench. And I think that comes down to the coaching staff to just sort of like realign, reshuffle it, whatever you have to do to make that gear, you know, you know, um, fit with the next cog. Make the revisions. Do what's necessary to do it. It's just like, oh, well, we've only got Greg, so we're just going to have to keep playing him. It's like, no, you've got a squad of about 30-odd people, you know, including some of the junior boys and that. Figure a way how to do it so that it's not, you know, that, that we don't have people playing that are not there by merit. And I think that's that's a big part of culture. It's like anything. You get, it's just like, how come they're getting that and I'm not? Or, you know, it's just, you, you'll get that jealousy. And it's, it's rife in football, you know? And I'm, and, I'm sure, and I'm sure you hear it as well, too, when you're talking to each other on the pitch. And so I know you're close to the action. The, is there a lot of shouting at each other on the pitch these days, Phil? Like when the, when the players are going and you see that we're struggling and all that, who's mm. the vocal ones? Who's shouting the, the, the encouragement and or who's just being a dick? <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of incidents this season where I've really seen it. Um, I can remember when we lost to Hearts on oh, a grim day at Celtic Park when they beat us before Christmas. And there was a lot of finger pointing in the box after Shanklin scored the header at the back oh, post to the corner. I think Johnson, Taylor, maybe it was Scales and Taylor, but there was a lot of like shouting at each other, like, he was your man. No, he was your man. You no, know, that sort of thing. Kyogo gets frustrated at every single game. You don't see it on the see cameras that. necessarily, but off the ball in the stadium, you see it where he's making runs and they just, you know, pass it side to side and whatnot instead of looking for maybe a long ball into the channel or something and you see him throw his arms up in the air. Yeah, yeah. But I don't really see many players that are really like, you know, vocal each other. Scott Brown was obviously the the blueprint for it, you know, back in the day when he was a captain, you know, shouting at them and whatnot and try to you know, rail them up a wee bit. But I don't see much in the way other than we instance here and there, like um, you know, like um let's say the the one against Hearts. There's there's not too much of it, I feel. And I don't know if again I think they don't realise the the gravity of the situation. I'd like to think that they do because I want to see them having a bit of a go at each other because you want a bit of fucking fire. Because some of the passes that they play, so I mean, you just see them getting a bit frustrated, like a bit like, oh, you know, just throw their hands up. But there's no actual proper, like, you know, really having a go at each other. So it's something that the passes you see, like, you know, behind the player. I know Taylor's quite good at, uh, I say good, but doing this, like, you know, the winger will be making a run and he plays it behind him. Instead of trying to play it into his path, he plays it behind him. So the players already like made a run and he's like it's, right. it's behind him goes right for a throw in and stuff like that and you'll see them like, throw their hands up in the air and stuff so yeah but I haven't seen any proper like real having a go at each other I say other than the first one that comes to mind was the Hearts game when Shankland scored and there was a bit of arguing in the box just kind of all pointing fingers at each other like no oh, you're supposed to mark him oh it was your man so yeah that does a fun way of confidence yeah. so, but it would be good to see them with a bit more fire in the belly at this time well, it looks like now the only leader in the park is uh, Joe Hart. Joe mm. Hart seems to be the most, like to me, watching it on the telly every week. You know, I, I see him as being the one that's the most vocal. And, and Joe Hart is something that you would, somebody you would listen to, somebody that's got the respect for the experience that he's done. You know, whereas other players shout now, you, you know, my views, I just tell you to shut up, you know. It's mm-hmm. like, get on with my game. I don't think that would work too well. So here's the question for the bus. Who do you think we'll see first? Kate Middleton or James McCarthy? Who'll come out? <laughs> who do you think we'll see? Who do you think we'll see proof of life first? <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, I should have put that as a poll at the start of the show. I could put that as a poll in the going, but there you go. James right. McCarthy or Kate Middleton. That's that's an interesting one, yeah. God damn uh, I mean, 
it's almost like we're screaming out for a James McCarthy right now. And, and I can't say that because I can't even remember seeing him play for Celtic. I think it was a, a couple of games about two years ago, and that was <laughs> it. And like, does he still train with the team? You know, you just never no hear him. And it's just like, is he forgotten? You know, is it is it halfway Mark Lattle? You know. <laughs> Another one that needs a picture. Yeah, that is that is a, a mental one. People are loving that comment by the alien. Well done, man. Lots of laughs coming <laughs> in the chat. It's fantastic, man. Uh, but you're right. I mean, the, the, the James McCarthy one, it just baffles us again. Where in the window, the January window there, there was a team that offered to take him on it's loan, like but Celtic wouldn't do it because they wouldn't pay the full wages. So, no, what we'll do, we'll do the most Celtic thing possible. We'll keep him and we'll pay him his full wages. And it's like, what? So, uh, honestly, man, he's literally in the squad to tick a box, essentially, that he is a homegrown player, but he just gets registered for that. But yeah, he's not played a game. I think I worked this out the other week on the show. He's not played since McDermott Park last season when they got a late equaliser, then Jack Marcus scored the winner, but he was directly involved in the winning goal by Bye. winning the ball back, played it to Bern the Bay, Bern the Bay, put it across the goal, and Jack Marcus put it in at the back post. Um, yeah, McCarthy, Bernabeu and Jackamacus. There you go. There's three names involved in that goal as well. God almighty. Hey, uh, what do you make of Bernabeu missing his flight? Did it's just that? typical Bernabeu. It's the most Bernabeu thing possible. It's like, you know, he misses his flight, misses his debut. <laughs> But, it was in Amsterdam as well, which is a bit suspect and all that. That is a bit sus. Like... Yeah, <laughs> just a tad, but yeah, it's the most um is the most burn the by thing possible. Just again a microchasm of his time at Celtic summed up in that incident there. Uh right. he misses his flight, misses his debut. Uh, let's go back into the comments and see what's getting said. Also, a thanks to Craig A, who's gifted one Boise Bus membership. Tattoo Face is gifted one as well. And Gary oh, Brown, Brown. Cheers, as well. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, Graham Tyrrell, this is one that comes up a lot, and I'm sure when we get to the summer, we'll be discussing it again. Depending on how this season goes, will we be looking back on this moment and talking about like what happened in 2009? We'll go and see if we'd sign Stevie Fletcher instead of Willow Flood. We might actually win the league because we might have scored more goals. Majofsky, are we going to look back? He says, who else should we be looking at? My Oski question mark. Again, with what's going on right now with Celtic when it comes to the transfer, obviously Mark Lawwell is leaving on gardening leave. He's gone already. I don't know exactly, but apparently he's definitely going. I said a few weeks ago when it was announced, my feeling is this sounds good. This sounds great that he's going because he has definitely been a huge, huge problem with the whole recruitment. Massive problem. But for me, it's what happens next with the recruitment because... If this is what's going to happen again next season, if they just replace him with somebody else, but they keep the same strategy, what have we achieved? If Brendan Rodgers stays on, regardless if we win the league, lose the league, whatever happens, if Brendan stays, and this is still going to be the strategy, I don't know how much more I can take watching this, because this season has been brutal. And it's like, we need an overhaul from top to bottom, and the recruitment, we need to change strategy, we need to change tact massively. Majofsky... I was very in favour of his signing Majofsky and all the, the run-up to the January window. I was like, yes, I would definitely go for him. I had a choice between him and Shankland. Um, I would take Majofsky. But to, to be fair, with the way things are at the moment, the injuries we've got, I would take both right now because of the, the injury problems we've got. Uh, but yeah, to me, you know, it was quite appropriate that, you know, days after the window closed, Liam, we go up to Pataudry, we draw one each and he absolutely ragdolls our defence that day, scoring his goal, just makes uh, Navrosky look just rank amateur, the way he just turned him and bent it into the corner. It's like typical. That's typical that would happen, wouldn't it? Uh, right. But yeah, in the summer, we're going to need to see a huge overhaul. Majofsky would be a good start for me. Again, he's a guy that's proven he can score in this league. Um, when you're talking about, oh, would you rather have O, who was still a very raw prospect, or Majofsky, who does score in this league? What would you go for? I'd say Majofsky for me. But overall, the whole strategy needs to change, and it's it's over to you, Celtic, for the next move. Say, show me what the next move is. Whoever gets appointed into that position, hopefully their second name isn't Strachan or Lawwell. Just hopefully that's not the case. That's when I'll suddenly take a lot of interest in this because right now I'm like, okay, that's that's great that they've done that. What's the plan, though? So it makes you wonder who's been handling the recruitment right now mm -hmm. because we've seen active players and we've seen motion and all that where Abada and Japanese boy Kobashabi are. Wait, could be acid. <laughs> um, so who's making all the decisions right now? Is that back to is that back to Lyle? Is that Greg Strachan? You know, so you, you wonder who's making those moves right now. 
I thought as soon as they announced Mark Lowell was gone that they would probably be actively recruiting and searching for somebody to come in and be a director of football. And if that's the case, you expect to see somebody coming in there March, April. Give them two months to assess what we've got. Mm. Go and start making the contacts, throwing the feelers out there, ask the questions, you know, go out there and find out who's available. You know, I don't know if you can tap me off at Aberdeen at this point, but, you know, put, put the question out there or, or, you know, filter it through. It's like, all right, what's the asking price? Because in the summer when the season's done, we're definitely inter- interested. My biggest fear is we do the usual and that, you know, it, it always seems like the when the transfer for window opens, that's when they blow the dust off the, the big book and open it up. And like, right, let's see who's available. You know, and, oh, well, oh, well, we'll start we'll start after the long weekend. You know, it's three days into it, but that way we'll have a good long weekend. We'll be refreshed. And then we'll start scouting players. I, it, just, it just reeks of contracts in the showers and things like that right now, the way we do business. That I think they'll wait till the season's done to see how we are. Or if we won the league or we didn't win the league, then we're going to react and we're going to make the change. And that's the problem. We're no proactive. There's mm-hmm. no vision in this club whatsoever, other than like the next couple of weeks or the next next family member that's going to walk through the door. That's the only vision. Or coming through family photos and yearbooks and shit like that. You know, there's there's no one out there casting a wide net and being creative. And, you know, just going out there and trying to find the best that's out there. There is, you know, I'd even take Mourinho at this point. I hated Mourinho. But now it's like, come back, it's all forgiven, you know. Mm. But I wouldn't have him as a manager, maybe as a director of football or something. You know, because his contacts would be absolutely amazing. You know, he's seen boys coming through all sorts of different academies, you know, in, in, in Spain and Italy, all the other place. You know, so... Um, I think, yeah, I'm, I'd be disappointed if we go into May and we don't have a we don't have a football guy, a guy that's in charge of rebuilding this team because we've got a big rebuild. Joe Hart's leaving, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you, you can see them doing well. Let's let's have a, a fight between Bain and uh, Seagrass to see who can claim that jersey, <laughs> you know, and, and see if there's an opportunity. But that seems to be what we did with Turnbull and. And, and Mikey Johnson and all that this year as well without any success. Yeah. It's like, okay, I we got our answer. But there wasn't anybody in the in the fan base that, that was surprised by that answer. You know? Mm. I don't think anybody's even surprised that Mikey Johnson's doing well. As I said last week, it's like some boys are really, really good when they move away from home. You know, he's just might have too many pals, too much too much people in the crowd telling him what he did and how he should be doing it and where there's a chance just to go and play his football and listen to coaches and all that, and no fans and his support group, his pals and his family and all that. So best of luck to him, but I don't think he's a good player for Celtic. So we need we need to get somebody that's going to recognise who, who are the players that can come in, play for Celtic, understand the pressures of what we have, hit the ground running and spend a wee bit of money. And again, all that money we've saved up, we're going to have to spend that. We will get money for Frimpong this year as well. Frimpong could end, he could end up being a Champions League winner as well, the way his team's going and the way he's playing. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll, we'll get money for him. Yeah. And again, and, and O'Reilly probably. So that's a massive, massive rebuild. But we've mm-hmm. got the funds to do it. You know? Yeah. We shouldn't be in this position. We only had to get three players right and we went for 20. You know, idiotic. Yeah, it's um yeah the Frimpong thing I totally forgot about. The board will be ticking down the the, the minutes till that happens because yeah we have got a sale on there. And I think whenever Xabi Alonso goes in the summer, and I think he's going to have a choice of a few clubs with the way Leverkusen have been playing. Then I think Frimpong goes with him, especially if it's exactly. Liverpool, because I think the whole like, Alexander Arnold's kind of transitioned into a midfielder, so they're going to need a right back. And it's like Jeremy Frimpong would be a great fit there if he goes along with Xabi Alonso. Yeah, it's like board. Will be like, oh yes, Robin has has more money in the coffers. There we go, more. But they need to, they need just invest. And again, it's not a case of we need to spend every single penny that we've got. It just goes back to we need to be scouting better. And it goes back to the point again. Lawwell's leaving. Mark Lawwell's leaving. That's great. But what's the next move? We need to see a real progressive move. We need to see football men. Not businessmen. Not guys that have ran what golf shops or whatever it was. Uh, the Craig Strachan ran. 
Uh, that's what we need to see. We need to see people who are actual football men heading up these departments um, because, yeah, the recruitment needs a, a massive, massive overhaul. And I'd like to think that in the summer. And Brendan has already been saying things about next season already, which is interesting. So, I mean, I hope it all works out this season, has a happy ending for us. And then in the summer, we overhaul everything and everything's hunky dory next season. The football's fantastic. I hope so. I pray to God that's what's going to happen. But right now, with the way things are and the way the Celtic board have performed over the years, I I don't know at this point in time. I, I can't even predict what's going to happen next. It's a it's a, it's a rocky road. You said before, I think last week, it's a roller coaster. We need to buckle up, Liam. Yeah. Hey, Phil, I heard a wee rumour today. Okay. On this side of, on this side of the Atlantic, through the Vancouver Club. Right. Celtic uh, summer tour, North America this year. They're in okay. talks with New York right now. Right. I mean, that would be absolutely brilliant. I mean, it's, I've got a chance to attack Greg Taylor personally. Um, oh. But uh, yeah, I th- I'd, so it'd be interesting to see if they come over here and, you know, if we can make any alliances with some of these MLS teams. We've obviously got a channel there open where you know we're seeing players move back and forward. You know, I was surprised that was a market we didn't go in. Hmm. You know, and we we didn't go into uh, um, you know like in, in the new year because that was open. There was still a lot of players that could have moved, and and you know this oh it's hard to get players over the window. Well, there's a lot of young players coming out of South America, Central America, um, uh, Caribbean. Oh, that's a, and then Canada and the US that could easily adapt to the, the Scottish game, you know. And all we have to do is be really, really clever, and, and it wouldn't cost us a ton of money to recruit some of these players. Um, be interesting to see if there's uh, anybody in the management side as well, anybody that's recruiting, anybody over there that's coming from the MLS, and to, you know, and, and, and hope that we can get lucky again the way we did with Ange. I always thought the guy that's now the manager of Toronto FC, uh, John Herdman, I always thought he was quite good in his approach to football. I liked mm-hmm. where he's going, but I don't know. I'm waiting to hear back from my Toronto FC pals or how he thinks he's doing this year. But I thought he did very, very good with a Canada team. And he was he, he was good at like fitting and making a team out of that. You know, like we, um, building stuff around Alfonso Davies. You know, it's not easy to build a team around a left back, you know. Yeah. So, on the, yeah. but I thought he was able to do that. Um, see, there's another Canadian boy who got signed to Aberdeen just at the, at the, just after the close of the window. He was able to come in. Was it Hulet? Oh, Junior support. Hoylet. Yeah, yeah. Neil Warnock got him up there, but now Neil Warnock's away. Aye. Well, it's, it's funny. Somebody in the Vancouver club told me they saw him in the street like three weeks ago. He so, said, oh, yeah, we saw him in the corner. I, I guess he loves here part-time. He used to play with Vancouver. At one point. Yeah, because he was at QPR, I think, when Neil yeah. Warnock was a manager. But he brought him up to Aberdeen now. Neil Warnock's left after 33 days, which is a strange one because uh, people have thought that Neil Lennon might be the next uh, Aberdeen manager. Boise was shouting for that for ages, yeah. saying that because yeah. he apparently left Aberdeen because apparently they advanced advanced talks with the next manager, which they still haven't announced yet. So for the advanced talks, then... I don't know if that's the case at all, but just another another day in the world of Scottish football, another crazy caper there uh, with that one. Uh, but yeah, the um, Aberdeen, in fact, speaking of them, obviously we drew them in the uh, Cup semi-final. So will Neil Lennon be in the Aberdeen dugout by the time we go to play them? Is that what's going to happen here? Because one of my mates says it would just be bloody typical that he ends up there and they just further just ruin our season by beating us. I hope to God that's not the case, because that was just, oh no, just a very thought of that, hopefully no. But I think when you look at the draw and who we could have got, Aberdeen, Hearts or Rangers, I think it was probably the best draw that we could have got, Liam, for the Scottish Cup semi-final. I, I, th- I think so as well. I feel fairly confident we'll do them over. You know, it's, uh, mm. it's a team in turmoil, something like ourselves, but I don't know, don't don't underestimate their ability to fuck it up either right now. You know, we just fucking one miss pass away at all times. We just we just keep it so close. You know, I'm never comfortable with a Celtic team unless we're pulling away now. You know, even at, you know, two one, two nothing, you know, as it gets in, it's, it's still I've got like a like a three goal cushion. Oh, you can't even relax. What would you think? Do you think they'd look at Neil Lennon as the director of football? 
Seen the Celtic? It. Aye. I think you think it'd be you see brave that? to do that right now, given I think there's still some uh, raw wounds of a few years ago for a lot of fans. But then again, we Brendan Rodgers, what Aye. happened to him leaving? And yeah, well, again, <laughs> that hasn't quite gone how we thought it would, but. I don't know. Again, with the Celtic board, they don't really read the room, do they? So um, would they appoint Neil Lennon to some sort of high-ranking position within the club? Um, yeah. <laughs> who knows at this stage? Yeah. I mean, is there any of their ex-players now that are in management that are doing really, really well? You know, it's, I, well. Like I know recourse does stuff with the, the Danish team and that, but I don't know if he's got his full coaching badges for that. Sean Maloney, he had a brief early into coaching and I think there was a lot of people before Ange we were talking about giving Sean Maloney a shot yep. he seems to have disappeared Petrov was going to be a manager at one point um, Lambert Lambert well, yeah. Brown Warrior saying Lambert I know he's not right. in a job right now but um, yeah he's obviously been floating around he's had jobs doing in the English Premier League Aston Villa Norwich he's done like those yeah. types of jobs but um, yeah he's never really they really hit any dizzying heights, just a sort of very steady sort of manager, essentially. Uh, that, you know, but Lambert's interesting because, you know, even if you look at the way his career panned out as well, there was at one point where, you know, they were writing letters to every club in Scotland to try and see if they could get him a game with anybody. And they ended up in the European, you know, fucking bossing it in, a, you know, the Champions League final, you know, within a season. So you wonder if it comes about fit and all that and pressure and stuff. Where he seems to be a guy that thrived on pressure. He seems to be a guy that maybe, you know, maybe it's probably really, really hard to motivate a team like Norwich or some mm. of the dumplings that he's managed. Where it's coming into Celtic, where, you know, he might be the John Collins type, you know, like, like insist on like heavy regime and training and all that and, and professionalism and all that. And that might be something that he might be better to bring to a club like Celtic than he is with one of these like minnows where. You know, you're just like a holiday type team. You know, it's like yeah. his name real, you know, your Norwich, that's it, you know. Aye, well, um, Ray, I smell the gloves seeing Raymond Vega as the new CEO. Yeah, Vega, he, that was one. Yeah. yeah. Samaras, Samaras is, uh, I think he's doing something in um, management, like a club president or something like that as well. He'd be another interesting shout. I mean, that's a guy that clearly loved the, loved the club. I think he did that. It, there's a lot of value when Samaras was here, you know, on mm. and off the park. I thought yeah. that whole thing he brought in with, you know, we JB and all that, and mm. it was just pure class. And, you know, like one of the players would love to see come back. And, you know, and Raymond Vega as well, anytime you, you hear him speak, he's, you know, he's, I think he managed a bank and stuff like that as well, like, like something significant, mm. you know. So, I mean, there's guys out there that we have uh, attachments to, and it's like, that's why it's so frustrating when we just go doing the Strack and Lowell route every single time. And so, you know, it doesn't have to play a player that has no connection, but the ones that we do have connections to, there are still out there. Hmm. You know, I think the one that should get their arse kicked is who whoever let Jacinda go for how much money it was that she needed to go. Because that seems like, I was like, who has fucked up that one? I was like, all right, what did she make in the Birds team? Like, what did they get, like a five or a week or something like they're not, they're not getting five grand a week or anything, right? They're getting about maybe a grand or something or 500 quid. That was the idea. And for her to not renew her contract and then us losing a quality international player on the top of that because, yep. oh, what can you do, Cupid? Chain right? reaction, yep. Aye. That's, mm -hmm. you know, so, so it's been the season's, season of hell. We look back at this in nostalgia one day, Phil, and I hope we do. <laughs> Yeah, and you start looking at everything from a bad situation to Jacinda to Jota going to a team and never getting played. It's the most <sighs> bizarre season ever. Yeah, this is like oh, God. you know Grant Morrison comic book stuff where doors are open and the perceptions are wonky and we're living in parallel multiverses and mm. things like that. You know, because it's fuck, it just doesn't feel like a football season. It's, it's, it's crazy it's, when you just see some of the stuff there. I see Jota leaving to basically go and do nothing, essentially. Oh, he, the boy had the world at his feet playing for us. Yeah. It's like, man, the next move he gets is going to be incredible. What a player he's going to be. And then the circumstances he found himself in to go to Saudi Arabia and then they don't register him because the story was that they thought they were going to get Mo Salah before the end of the window. 
and that deal fell through, but they had to unregister one of their non-Saudi players to make space for Salah, so they chose Jota. But then the January window rolled around where they could have then registered them there, and they just didn't, and he's still there. He didn't get a move away or nothing. I think he tried to get a move, but yeah, it's just uh, what a bizarre, bizarre set of circumstances it's been for him, and a badder leaving the way it's all ended with him. Um, yeah, it's just been it's just been mental on all the injury problems. We find ourselves at points this season turning to Mikey Johnston and James Forrest in 2024. It's just like what what, what next? Hopefully, the, 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 whatever comes next is going up the way and upward trajectory. Yeah. Because we're definitely scraping the barrel at the moment, so the only way is up, surely, at this stage. I'm disappointed. I was hoping that um, Jota would start his own YouTube channel, like Bald and Bankrupt or something like that, because I know he likes to travel and that, and, and I thought it'd be good seeing, like, oh, where's where's Jota now? You know, and then showed up this <laughs> week, Jota's in Bulgaria or Vancouver, and he's strolling into the Celtic club at four in the morning, you know, I could vintage tap on or something you know, <laughs> you know, oh I did do that I certainly did enjoy back, doing that Cadetti on the back you know yeah. um, just we was going to festivals that sort of stuff because that summer where he was off from us and they showed up in New York playing fives with guys wearing a Celtic kit and all that mm-hmm. oh, what a disappointment that was to leave and I wish that boy all the best because he is yeah. another one that's just been really really mismanaged and through no fault of his own but I mean, problem I wouldn't mind having right there. You know, all that, that I know, that's true. Week or <laughs> yeah, to do nothing essentially. So before we go, obviously, because we've done an hour now, and uh, thanks everyone for watching. Because yeah, we had to do a sort of impromptu Friday night forum slash TNF because uh, yeah, TNF wasn't on last night because circumstances got in the way. We've also had a pneumatic drill, a jackhammer causing havoc, but it seems to have disappeared halfway through the show. So they obviously got it's the good, message, got the memo. The, 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 they realised, oh God, we are doing a podcast up there, we better stop. So right. thankfully that's <laughs> all. But yeah, so just again, one of these things. It's just, like, just like Celtic season, everything was going against us tonight, Liam. But no, we managed oh. to come through it anyway. Before we go, obviously, the game tomorrow, St. Johnston. We've got to get the points, mate, by hook or by crook. Liam, is it going to be a comfortable win? Is it going to be an ugly win? Is it just going to be a win? Uh, please give me some some positive fear, a positive one to end on here, Liam. Uh, he's shaking his nah, head. This I, is I don't bad. see it. I don't oh, see no. it. I, I said I said last week. I said last week we drop points. I said it I said it a week before as well. Oh, with the, the hearts game went up, yeah. I where I just don't feel comfortable with this game. We're not addressing the problems. We're not nobody's like they, they, there doesn't seem to be a chemistry in this team right now, and that's what's missing. I don't think it's down to individual mistakes. I think it just has to be uh, something wrong with the culture of this team where they're not performing for the manager. And I don't think it's because they don't want to. I just think I just think the culture's wrong right now, that the mood's wrong, and the people that are meant to be leading and leading are not, not helping us right now. So three nothing, Greg Taylor hat trick. <laughs> there you go. After all that, finishes on that one. Three nothing. I'll say a very Ugly and nervy 2-1 victory, but a victory nonetheless. But I don't see it being a pretty game. I see similar problems to last week. We'll take the lead. They'll somehow peg us back, and then we'll we'll find a winner somehow. But it's going to be an ugly wash, sadly. Right. But I hope I'm wrong. I hope it's like the Dundee game the other week, and we just come out and blitz them. That'd be fantastic if it is. But regardless, I'll be there tomorrow to see it. Um, and hopefully, still like put on a show for us. A lot of Good predictions coming in here. 3 1, 7 0, 4 1, 3 0, 5 0. Resounding, resounding support for Celtic tomorrow because you're at this stage, they just need to find a way, a way, some way, somehow. Just got to get it done, boys. So, yeah, we will head off now. Thanks everyone for joining us for making this impromptu Friday night forum. Uh, normal service should be resumed over the weekend. Uh, but, yeah, of course, if you haven't subscribed yet, Hit the subscribe button, of course, on the way out mm-hmm. if you haven't done so. Uh, we can promise that there'll be uh, the pneumatic drill is not a regular feature on the bus. Yep. It just uh, bad circumstances tonight, but we got through it regardless. Uh, but yes, if you hit that, that'd be massive. Thank you very much, folks. And uh, if you go to the game tomorrow, or if you're watching it by whatever means necessary, however you manage to watch it, enjoy it, and uh, hopefully next time we see you, we'll be talking about another Celtic victory. So we'll catch you later, guys. All the best. See you. Bye.